It's your weekly dose of confessions. Coming up, a bit of this. I cannot actually believe you've just admitted that on national radio. And some of this. I'm going to forgive Dano just because at no point did you mention New York and, and, and me in an Irish bar. Hello and welcome to another of our Olympic Confessions podcasts. This week's collection of terrible tales comes from an array of sinful BBC colleagues, including our very own Vassos Alexander, and our friends at Five Live, Ian Dennis, Eleanor Oldroyd and Ian Carter. A lot of alcohol is about to be consumed. Here it all is. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for another Olympian confession. What extraordinary, devastating tales. Many careers blighted as uh, some of the BBC's finest sporting correspondents have laid their careers on the line by telling us bad stuff. Uh, had a good time last week. We have the one and only Ian Dennis with us for tonight's confession. Hello, Ian. Hello, Simon. Now, I'm not quite sure. Sh- are you senior football correspondent? Is that the right title? I, I was senior football reporter until this confession. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, OK. And are you exclusively football f- uh, for, the, uh, for the Olympics, or what else do you do? No, I'm exclusively football. I've been covering Great Britain's men and women and hoping that they'll be in medal contention after tonight. And are you having... Uh, on balance, are you having more fun reporting the women or the men? I think I'm having more pleasure reporting the women than the men. Yes, I think that's <laughs> probably fair enough. Uh, now, I'm not sure what uh, I'm not sure what we're going to get from you. What's uh, Matt? What's uh, what's? Ian's I'm thinking reputation? number one, it's going to be messy, and number two, it had better not involve me. Well, let's uh, let's find out. Ian Dennis, senior football reporter. Until now, let's uh, take it away. What do you have? Well, dear Father Simon yes. and the Assemble Collective. It's a double confession to my former employers and also to an unnamed hotel in Moscow that shall remain nameless, so I'm not tracked down by any special agents. Messy already. Although I did apologise at the time, I think it's only right that I should make a public apology to a former Scottish international who is a Leeds United legend in Peter Lorimer. One of the hardest shots in football, of course, he was known as 90 miles an hour. Now, I used to room with Peter, or indeed Norman Hunter in my days at BBC Radio Leeds. They've both seen me worse for wear, as has Matt. But I'm not <laughs> mentioning Broughty Ferry near Dundee, because that is a confession not for Good. public consumption. Even for Ian, Peter's friend. But if you are listening, Ian, I'm sorry to you too for that particular night. Anyway, to set the scene, it was the autumn of 1999, but already winter had set in in Russia. Leeds United had just beaten Lokomotiv Moscow in the UEFA Cup. We were on the shuttle bus at the airport on a bleak day in Moscow, travelling back with the team, when we heard in the draw that Leeds had been paired with Spartak Moscow in the next round. So in three weeks, we would return to Russia. Now, on the first trip, Radio Leeds had asked me to co-present the breakfast show. And despite a four-hour time difference in my favour, I objected to doing the same for our next visit. I cited I needed time to prepare for an important commentary. So they asked the Peter Lorimer to help out in my place. In the intervening three weeks, the weather had taken a turn for the worse. It was cold, mind-numbing cold, minus 20, so colder than cold. Now, our hotel overlooked the Kremlin, and when you walked outside, the cold pierced your thermal clothing. You couldn't feel your legs. It was that cold. Now, as usual, we went to training on the eve of the game, but the pitch was frozen, rock hard. Leeds United were not happy, yet the officials were insistent that the game would go ahead. We were sceptical. That's our job in the media. But we returned to the warmth of our hotel. What I didn't plan was bumping into some of our colleagues from Five Live on the eve of the match. Now, they shall remain nameless. They paid me hush money. The pundit now works for another channel. The producer has also left the BBC, but you never know, he might employ me after this confession. Anyway, there I was, young and impressionable, with a full head of hair, fresh face, (laughs) glasses. Think of Will from the in-betweeners and you get the picture. I was also very keen to move to Five Live, so a night to socialise was an opportunity not to miss. Matt will tell you, it's not like me normally to be led astray. No, no, true. Anyway, one drink led to another, which led to another, and it got to the stage where... If anybody wanted to go to bed, another round had just been bought. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and nobody had bailed out. Now, I wanted to keep pace with my peers, being this young and impressionable young sort of guy, and the night appeared to fade away until I saw Peter walking down for breakfast at 8.30, and he gave me a disapproving look that said it all. We'd stayed up all night. And while now I look back with a real sense of achievement... That night, I felt a shame that I'd let Peter down. So I skulked away to my room that I shared with Peter while he went off to co-present the breakfast show. But I was in for a rude awakening, literally. 
I was woken up by Peter some three or four hours later, informing me that the game had been postponed due to a frozen pitch and all hell had broken loose. So as a result, I had to now react to this breaking story. Never a good idea with sleep deprivation and a stinking hangover. But being the consummate professional that Matt always tells me that I am, I carried off my reports and interviews before realising I had to fly back immediately to England because we were flying back with the team. So as Peter and myself then had to make our way to the airport, I said to one of the five live commentators to let me know what I owed him for the previous night's escapades in the bar and I would settle up with him. As it transpired, we'd seen off three separate sets of bar staff Nobody had been charged by the hotel, so the bill was unpaid. Oh, boy. And that, Father Simon, is my confession. Although I can plead innocence, that I'm only guilty by association for the unpaid bill, but I do take full responsibility for being somewhat of a diva and not co-presenting the breakfast show. But as you know only too well, it takes a special quality to get up in the early hours, and I thought Peter was better suited. And can I finally add in mitigation that the producer that night became the editor who offered me a job three years later and I would like to think it was that bonding session that proved so crucial in my career development as I now beg for forgiveness. So basically what you're talking about is, is a complete lack of professionalism. Uh, <laughs> and and that the lure of another bottle of vodka was stronger than the lure of a successful broadcasting career. Well, the fact I can tell you now that it wasn't vodka, because when I drink vodka, I can't remember. And the <laughs> fact that I can still remember something that happened in 1999, it's safe to assume that vodka was not consumed. So, uh, OK, so what we're talking about is, is a bar bill, are we saying maybe hundreds of pounds? Possibly, yes. Possibly wow. maybe four figures? No, I wouldn't... Mm, yes, yes. yes. Lines. <laughs> OK, all right, we're talking, you know, let's. this is hotel prices, OK? So we're talking about an unpaid bar bill, we're talking about a diplomatic incident. No wonder David Cameron and Putin are struggling <laughs> to get it together. You know, there are lots of big issues to sort out, but it's Ian Dennis's unpaid bar bill, which is at the heart of it. Just Ian, I'm not clear on one thing. Uh, you didn't intend ever to uh, co-present the breakfast show, even though it was four hours later than usual. Is that right? That, yes. Well, so I, it wasn't I, because I, you found yourself drunk that you didn't do it. You weren't ever going to do it. You just didn't want to. Yes, big deal. Correct. Yeah. 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 Ah, you yeah. just couldn't be bothered. Yeah. Well, no, I <laughs> couldn't be bothered. I, I had to prepare for a commentary. Of course. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I get it, yeah. I get it. All right. Um, I'd, so, I'm bit, that bit I'm going to just leave alone because I don't really understand it. The bit about the bar bill, I don't think it was your responsibility, as you say. Uh, it was your Five Live colleagues being more senior in the BBC pecking order at the time than you. Uh, and you, I think, were just a sort of almost an innocent bystander. That's what Thank it you. sounds like. Yes. So I am going to forgive you for that. For the lack of professionalism and, and the breakfast thing, I'm not really sure, I'm afraid. So I'm just going <laughs> to reserve judgment there. So is he forgiven or not? He's forgiven for the bar He's bill. Forgiven. Yeah. Okay, He's yeah. forgiven, OK. He's forgiven. Brother yes. um, Who'd have thought the words Ian Dennis and unpaid bar bill would be in the... Oh, uh, in the yes. <laughs> we in the same sentence. Um, and, and Ian Dennis and diva behaviour, who'd have thought of that? Oh. No, never me. Is, this even harsh? Harsh? is he famous for this kind of behaviour? <laughs> no, behavior? not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, I, I think this is outstanding. Um, I'm, I'm going to forgive Dedo just because at no point did you mention New York and, and, and me in an Irish bar. That's so, so intriguing. Yeah, though. indeed. Um, um, so I, I am, I'm definitely going to forgive, because, frankly, it's up to the hotel, isn't it? The hotel is deciding to give out free drinks, then that's up to them. Uh, not right. up to Ian Dennis, the uh, senior football reporter. Let's hope that's still there. And, uh, <laughs> what, and, happened to, what happened in New York? Uh, um, that's I another confession, I Simon. I think that um, Ian was drinking vodka that night, so I'm sure he doesn't remember either. <laughs> uh, I know that I certainly don't. Um, so, uh, Dedo, well done. Uh, a, a consummate pro, as ever, and never pay your bar bill. You remain a friend. Uh, Ian, th uh, thank you very much indeed. Have a good remaining, uh, however many uh, matches you have left to report on for the Olympics. <laughs> this could be my last. It could be your <laughs> last. Uh, the people's verdict is due. You can uh, text us now, please. 88291. Ian Dennis, thank you very much indeed. Strains of Albinoni's Adagio. Let you know there's another drive time. Olympic confession coming up. The collective are herein assembled and we welcome another of the esteemed choir which make up the BBC Olympic sporting correspondents. This time it's none other than Eleanor Oldroyd. Good afternoon. Hello, Simon. How are you doing, Ellie? I'm feeling a little nervous facing all of you, but yeah, well, I'm very quite, happy to be here. Quite rightly so. Uh, what are your uh, Olympic duties? What are your tasks in this fortnight? I am a, a multi-sports reporter stroke commentator for BBC Radio and TV. I'm covering judo for radio, and then I'm switching to... TV and I'm covering uh, synchronised swimming and modern pentathlon. 
So if you count them all up, that is actually seven sports. That's a lot of, that's a lot of homework if you're it's not a lot sort of of homework. instinctively at home with judo on the radio. No, that's going to be a challenge. Didn't, didn't DLT do that as a regular Sunday <laughs> quiz? <laughs> No. If he didn't, he should have done. That would have been... It's quite an idea, actually. It is. Uh, OK, so that's what you're going to be doing uh, for this fortnight. But before we go any further, in fact, before you're allowed to carry on in your career, uh, you have to tell us your story. So uh, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it to you. Take it away. Simon and the Collective, I'd like to take you back to the very start of my BBC career when I was a mere rookie in the exciting world of sports broadcasting at BBC Radio Shropshire. Now... Shropshire has a lot going for it as a county. Rolling hills, friendly people, historic market towns and great food. Yeah, but, yeah. with apologies to the good folk of Shrewsbury Town, it's not exactly a hotbed of sporting excitement. However, my spell at Radio Shropshire coincided with the halcyon days of the mighty Telford Tigers ice hockey team. Now, they never reached the heights of British ice hockey's Premier Division and the chance to rub shoulders or even clash helmets with the likes of the Cardiff Devils, the Sheffield Steelers or, of course, Simon, the Nottingham Panthers. Yeah, well, Nottingham is the home of uh, everything on ice. And, to indeed, Torville, Dean and the Panthers. And all those. Um, but in the late 1980s... Couldn't, to the sta couldn't stand it myself, but anyway, carry on. <laughs> I loved it, as you will find out. In the 80s... To the strains of Survivor's classic Eye of the Tiger. Of course. Telford Ice Rink would rock on a Saturday and Sunday to the crunch of stick on puck and bone on plexiglass. It was a touch of North American glitz on the fringes of the black country. And there were some notable Canadian imports in my time there, the likes of player coach Chuck Taylor. Aye, aye. The terrier like Mark Buds. No stranger to the sin bin he. Mark Buds. Mark Buds. Okay. And my personal favourite. Dancing Dean Vogel sang. Of and course, let's, let's Dancing just, Dean. Let's just live with that again. Dancing Dean Vogel sang. Vogel sang. Are you sure yeah. he wasn't a male stripper? <laughs> Frankly, that's what he sounds like. I should have tried harder. I have just been to see Magic. But Mike. don't preempt my <laughs> punchline, <laughs> Simon. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Dancing Dean Vogel sang. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, I think you could probably guess, Simon, knowing me and knowing my height that most of them towered over me by at least a foot when I went to interview them. What is your height? Five foot one okay. and a bit. But apart from the delights of going to interview them, uh, they introduced some new phrases into the lexicon of sport. It was no longer back of the net. It was biscuit in the basket. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And there were some strange North American habits too, such as the locker room interview. Reporters were welcomed with open arms sometimes somewhat sweaty open arms, nice. into the inner sanctum to hear the post-match thoughts of coach or captain. The challenge of doing a stand-up interview with a six-foot-tall ice hockey player was even greater when that six-foot-tall ice hockey player was still wearing his skates. But the fact that I was small, five foot one and a bit, female and in my early 20s, didn't cause any outbreaks of shyness among the players when I went in to interview them. Far from it. The tiny towels, which were all they had to conceal their modesty. Oh, I say. Had a habit of slipping. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this sounds this is... more and more like my perfect job. <laughs> <laughs> Debauchery in Shrewsbury. Sally, it's not too late. <laughs> the tiny what happened? towels. So there I was. Thanks to the biscuit, by the way. I <laughs> <laughs> it was in the basket, of course. All right. But so they, they were, there I was trying very hard to concentrate and gaze into the eyes of the person I was interviewing when all around me, these tiny towels were slipping. Isn't that a, fa a famous piece of classical music? Are you sure music? this really happened? <laughs> this was your dream no, no, last I have night. witnesses. I have several witnesses. <laughs> so anyway... I'm sure your tiny towels are slipping is a famous piece of classical music. <laughs> <laughs> Their tiny so hands were probably right. frozen yes, as well. Indeed. Anyway, this is the context of the BBC Radio Shropshire Charity Marathon Fundraising Night, 1986. <laughs> The Tigers played a game that evening and they made a collection among the crowd. And the arrangement was that after the match, I would receive the money on behalf of the charity live in the locker room. So there I was, young, fresh-faced, innocent, female, equipped with a microphone with a very long lead attached to the radio car. I gritted my teeth and I opened the door. And amid the scent of liniment and the jock straps hanging from the ceiling was my target, player coach Chuck Taylor, still in full hockey kit. He was always fully dressed, Chuck. He had a lot of dignity about him. Don't sound so disappointed. No. Couldn't have everything. 
Anyway, as I approached in my headphones, I could hear the voice of the presenter, the presenter in the studio. In a moment, we'll be live in the Telford Tigers dressing room with our intrepid reporter, Eleanor Oldroyd. Thank goodness I thought I don't want to be hanging around here too long. Yeah. Honestly. <laughs> then the fateful words. But first, a special request from Elsie Bloggs in Oswestry. She will pledge £10 to the charity if we play her favourite song, Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, the full eight-minute version. Good call. Those eight minutes, Simon, felt like eight hours. Did his towel slip? At any point. Did the jock straps dro drop from the ceiling? <laughs> At any point. <laughs> In a quivering... All of those things. All of those things. Towels are falling. Jock straps were dropping. <laughs> but my confession, Simon, is this. So there I was, I was 24. Mm. Single, female, mm. surrounded by attractive, sweaty, <laughs> testosterone-loaded, semi-naked men. This is almost too much for me. I can, I can only dream. What do you think happened next? I think you <laughs> tore all your clothes off <laughs> you, and you became an ice hockey player that day. <laughs> And that's what you've been doing every night when no one's looking. Simon, how long have we known each other? Uh, quite a long time. Quite a long time. Yes. Quite a long time. I made my excuses and left. What? Oh, Ellie. After doing, I did the interview and then I left. So I would like to beg forgiveness from you all for my complete and utter lack of adventure, for letting down my fellow women, especially you, Sally, oh. and for being extremely dull and professional. <laughs> Right, so, 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 and right. also for tantalising you, Simon, into thinking that something else was going to happen. Yes, I was getting a little. So, you, so your confession is about is, is is essentially that you that you wimped out and would uh, yeah. and were slightly too boring. I was very boring. I have been boring all my career. Have you regretted that moment? You've clearly oh, spent so, some, so many you've, occasions. You've clearly remembered it in extraordinary detail. Yeah. <laughs> Dancing Dean Vogel sang Simon. Well, I'm sorry. I, in a small town. There are enough images there that I, I've proved very unhelpful in my life. Uh, <laughs> Dancing Sister Rebecca, what do you so, make of that? Uh, Stairway to Heaven. I, yeah. We used to play that song in our school at the last dance, and it does go on an it goes awfully on long on. time. You just can't believe well, how long it is. It's a rock classic. Get on with it. It is a rock and, classic. And I was Apart focusing on the eyes of Chuck classic. Taylor. But tell me, did you, did you actually... You said you did the interview, so did I you did. actually do what you were required to do professionally? I'm afraid I did. And then you just left after that, I'm rather than hanging around. But what would... I mean... What would you have... I mean, what, what do you mean when you say you wimped out? What were you expected to have done, really? <laughs> what would, I'm not going mean, to ask you, Rebecca. Sally, what would you have done? Well, I would have... I would have, <laughs> I would have um, I I'm sorry, I'm still reeling at the thought of men, sweaty men in, in small towels. Did so. you have a windshield for your microphone? <laughs> Did you have a what? A windshield, a windshield, one of those little foam a things. A windshield? One of those that would have been oh, foamed no. oh, Let's almost not go there, Mr Mayor. You I just think you were on the job, so to speak, in a, in a professional <laughs> oh, no. way. In a the problem was she wasn't. In a most professional way, and if you'd done anything other than you did, it would not have been very uh, businesswoman-like or reportedly-like, and so I think you were absolutely right to leave. I don't think it was wimpish at all. I mean, Sal, are you going to say something? Yeah, you're going to say something scary, I well, think. Well, no, but I'm not. I think <laughs> you're completely... Completely forgiven, Ellie. Yes, I mean, uh, do you know what? If I if I'd have been in your shoes at that particular moment, I think I would have stayed. But I would have only stayed because I would have just hung around to see if anyone had shown me any interest, really. And or I shown think, you anything else? Or shown me anything at all? <laughs> or a night out in Oswald Street? <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of that man again? Um, you know, the man with the phone. Oh, no. Dancing, Dancing Dean, Dean Vogelson. Vogelson. Yes, I, you see, he sounds like my perfect man. Sweaty, a funny name, and a small Canadian. towel. Canadian, yeah. Um, so I, what I would have done, I would have stayed. I would have seen how the evening developed. But I don't blame you for, for wussing out at all. Because, you know, when you're that age and you're, you know, confronted by all these things in front of you. I, when I say things, <laughs> I mean, you know, men and stuff. That I would actually um, have been pretty, you know, I can understand that you were scared. So I forgive you. I would have played it differently myself, but I forgive you. In a moment, I might Google dancing Dean Vogel sound, <laughs> yes. but be careful not to do yes. the images. Make sure that you uh, have the uh, certain protection on the... 
internet when you do that. <laughs> yes. um, I, I would say, I, I, I've got to say, Ellie's reputation in the sport department is, is an impeccable one and a, an angelic one and, and, and a very a, a, a true professional as well, which is are why... You, this, are you disappointed that I, mean, I haven't no, come up with no, anything more salacious no, than this? I, I, I think, to be honest, this chime's very true, is that when confronted with a hulking great sweaty man wearing only a tiny towel to protect his modesty, you decided to make your excuses and leave, having done your professional duties. Well done to you, I say. Uh, Ellie and uh, I am I'm definitely going to forgive you uh, although I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in how these jock straps are hanging from the ceiling are, were, are, are they putting jock straps on ceilings now is that, is that how it works I don't know uh, staple guns is it, yeah clearly yeah hooks on the ceiling for your jock strap um, I'm going to forgive well done Ali I'm not going to forgive man. you because you, it's just not right to forgive an Arsenal supporter <laughs> It comes down to that, is it? <laughs> right. Essentially, yeah. if I was Blind on prejudice. a jury, that's... <laughs> that's Please, that's may it. I never be up for any, anyway, any but, serious trial with you on the, on the jury. Essentially, uh, it sounds like you're forgiven, Eleanor. Thank you very much indeed uh, for sparing us some time and breaking away from your important research into judo on the radio. It'll be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Have a great Olympics. Eleanor Aldroyd, thank you very thank much. Thank you. It's Albinoni Adagio, that's what this is, and it means it's, uh, it's confessions time. Olympic confessions we're running uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, featuring some of the BBC's top, top correspondents. They're very, very busy doing uh, Olympic duties, but they break off to talk to us. Today we have the BBC's one and only golf correspondent, former tennis correspondent. I give you Mr Ian Carter. Ian, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Simon. Um, golf is the main job, but of course it's tennis during the Olympics because we don't get golf into the Olympics until 2016, so I'm on tennis duty. Are, at the are moment. you kind of in favour in favor of that? I mean, the golfers don't need an Olympic medal, do they, to add to their vast oh, I'm very, wealth? Very much in favour of it. Uh, Rio? <laughs> course, <laughs> that's why. Of course, I'm, oh, right, course I'm in favour. So you of get it. to go to Rio de Janeiro, and that's why you're in favour of it. Exactly. I think it's, it's a, all about it's you. very sound reasoning, definitely. <laughs> and I think it's good for golf, and it's good for the Olympics to have golf there. I should say to Mother Superior, who's looking slightly vague at this point, not knowing who you are at all. <laughs> Sorry, Ian. That that's fair enough. Ian, He's probably never heard of me either. Ian has a reputation as being a hellraiser. His BBC nickname of Squeaky is ironic uh, and, and not in any way re referring to the fact that he is, is, a, is he, a good boy. He's a good boy. Yeah. He's a very, well, very yeah. bad boy. I'm very back? scared by this music, I must say. OK, well... Don't be, don't be. We're here to help. The collective are here. We wait to hear what Ian... I mean, most people think... I can't believe that Ian Carter has got anything to confess because you are such uh, a top chap... Uh, is that what yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's yeah. fair enough. He's got a very well, good reputation in sport. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, well I, can't, I can't believe I'm going to make this public, to be perfectly honest. Okay. Wow. But Simon's just said that you're known as squeaky because you're the opposite, so you've got a lot to confess by the uh, sound of it. No, 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 no. He was being ironic about the ironicness of it There's all. There's too much irony here. Yeah. <laughs> too much irony. It's Ian Carter's confession. Uh, here we go on Radio 2. Drive time then with Ian Carter. Over to you, sir. Well, Father Simon and the Gathered Collective, I do seek to beg forgiveness for something that's really been on my conscience for, for nearly 30 years now. It all surrounds the very start of my broadcasting career and the lengths that one will go to in pursuit of a job. I was just uh, completing a journalism course in the recession hit mid-1980s and in my defence, the need to get a job was seriously acute. Opportunities were very few and they were far between and there was a, a great need to say for, say, let's have a bit of ingenuity to, to make progress in the jobs market. Anyway, it became apparent that there was a sports media job going on in London and there was a phone number that I had to call if I was interested. Naturally, I seized this opportunity. I rang the number and very helpfully, the person at the other end explained that they were looking for commentators to describe action from television pictures down a phone line that people could then dial into to listen. It was a, a bit like a sporting equivalent to a dial a disc. I, re I remember that. Yeah. I used to ring well, that number every now and again. Did you? Yeah. yeah, I bet you didn't read this one. Um, this seemed like a, a pretty decent way to earn a living for, for me anyway. First proper job and all that. And, and the person on the end of the phone explained that the sport I would be commentating on would be horse racing. Now, of all the sports in all the world, the sport I have always known least about is racing. 
I have barely a passing interest, to be honest, in the sport. No great feel for it at all. This was a disaster. So this prospective boss asked me, is racing something you know about? Do you think you could do the job? And naturally I replied, yes, of course. Racing, love it. Grand National, Derby, Cheltenham, Red Rum. And with those words, I basically exhausted my knowledge there and then with that answer. Sounds like it. So this guy said, great, could you record yourself commentating on a race and send it to us on a cassette? Like I say, it was in the mid-1980s and everyone was into cassettes in those days. Well, Father Simon, I was doing some freelance work at BBC local radio at a station in the Midlands at the time. So I set out my stall to record my first ever commentary on a horse race. I chose the televised race. I think it was at Newbury. I think it was there. And I made sure that it had the fewest runners and over the shortest distance, just to give me an outside chance of doing a reasonably passable job. Alas, when the moment came, with the cassette whirring and the horses embarking on the run, all power of identification, analysis, comprehension and speech deserted me. The horses hadn't even reached the first hurdle and the recording was a complete and utter shambles. Excellent. So this wasn't good. So I had an idea at that point and I said to a colleague, did you record the the race off the national radio, Radio 2 in those times? And uh, the studio assistant said, yes. And I said, oh, could you pass it over? It was the late, great Peter Bromley who had done this particular uh, race. And uh, I then took the tape off and transcribed the whole commentary. Never did. This was an awful thing to do. And then I just added a few little tweaks and I sat there and (laughs) recorded it onto the cassette and then sent it off to this prospective uh, boss. Lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, I got a call. Mr. Carter, we were very impressed with your commentary. (laughs) surprise. The caller began. I could feel a bit of a butt coming on had I been rumbled, something like, um, yeah, it sounded rather familiar. No, the butt was uh, that uh, they liked it, but they'd had an, uh, an entry for the job from a bona fide racing commentator, someone that they'd not expected to be attracted to the job. So I'm afraid the racing job has gone, I was told. He then went on to wonder if I was interested in football. Well, this was heaven. This was wonderful because, of course, I was interested in that and I felt I could do that job. As it turned out, they offered me the job, but also I landed a more attractive role by a far less scurrilous means just a couple of days later. And I never did take that opportunity to become a phone-in sports commentator. Father Simon, I do beg your forgiveness, not for deceiving the phone company and making them think that I was more talented than I am, but for having the temerity, the ingenuity maybe, the barefaced cheek to steal the brilliant skills of a great commentator in the late, great Peter Bromley in my quest to make sure I landed the first job of my career. I just have to throw myself at your mercy. So you're basically a plagiarist, Carter. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Absolutely. Got it in one. Stealing words from someone else to his own glory. What do you say, Sister Rebecca? I cannot actually believe you've just admitted that on national radio. Neither can I. You've just admitted to plagiarism, which is really, you know, when it comes to like the rules of journalism, I think it's up there. Rule number one, you do not plagiarise other people's work. No, no, However, no. However, I think rule number two uh, to be a journalist is uh, ingenuity, ability to bluff in difficult situations, which you showed you were very good at. And clearly the gods were smiling on you that day because you got the great job of the football commentator, which is the one you wanted in the end. But I think, Ian, you've had too much good fortune in this whole episode. So personally, I can't forgive you. Sorry. Mother Superior. Ian. Yes. Who amongst us hasn't done a little plagiarism from time to time? I knew you'd be on my side. I am. Since I've heard that you're a bit of a scoundrel, I'm definitely on your (laughs) side. Um, And I think that it's fine to plagiarise. I mean... Is there, everybody here has plagiarised at some time. It no, wasn't. I haven't. Yeah, oh, oh it's true. I haven't. Oh, head girl <laughs> over there. She's never done anything wrong ever in her life. Um, but I think we all have to some extent. We've either plagiarised by copying other people, by listening to them, by repeating their comments. Uh, so I think the fact it got you a job, it got you into the, the career that you're obviously very good at and brilliant at, I think that from my perspective, you are totally in forgiven. 
Oh, thank you, Sally. And Matt, come on, you've you've copied my script. Uh, obviously, I, yeah, many times. There's no way I can sit here and start condemning you for plagiarising anyone else. Uh, Ian, uh, as you know, I have the morals of a sewer rat. So, frankly, <laughs> you know, I I think this is the least. And and if you're gonna if you're gonna plagiarise anyone, Peter Bromley's where you're going. And I also have a huge amount of um, admiration for the likes of Bromley and John Hunt, who we've had on the on the program many times. All racing commentators are very high in my estimation so uh, well done well, well done for having decent taste in who you're going to plagiarise well done <laughs> I, th- well, I, th- I think we might get some uh, plagiarism confessions I think they'd, yes, they'd, they'd, they'd be pretty good uh, and also those kind of dial a disc any kind of phone lines that you've <laughs> rung by mistake or something like that there might be some confessions are there. you going to give a verdict what oh yeah it? well I'll forgive Ian Come anything on, I'll oh, forgive Ian you. anything oh, because uh, it was Radio Leicester I imagine was the job was it well, I'm not allowed to say okay, it was Radio Leicester it wasn't no not at all not <laughs> at all okay. uh, but, but I've got this wonderful image of you dialing in to listening to the racing now I think that's a fantastic confession no, I th- well I think it's very good uh, I'll forgive Ian anything because uh, he's such a top broadcaster and anyone who's prepared to uh, sit in the commentary box for two weeks with me trying not to break wind <laughs> <laughs> really deserves pre- you trying not to yeah break me wind. yeah yeah oh, right okay two you weeks were on, trying two weeks on centre court it's a long time you know uh, great control uh, Ian thank you very much <laughs> thank you Simon that's Ian Carter back to his Olympic duties if you have a confession this is what you do you go to the website bbc.co.uk slash radio two you look for the drive time pages and you can confess from there. All uh, right, it's confession time. This is BBC Radio 2. The coll- Let me just check the collective. I know that two of the collective are here. Brother Matt and Brother Rebecca. Sister Rebecca. <laughs> it's the muscles, isn't it? That's true. <laughs> I had that vision just for a moment. So, uh, and Mother Superior, are you there? I am watching over you from afar. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. It's our final Olympian confession as we welcome to the programme the breakfast show's one and only Vassos Alexander wow. Vassos. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Uh, and... Just describe, I mean, you've been describing stunning views every morning with Chris in the (laughs) Olympic Park, in various places, and in the the swimming and everything. Just describe where you are now. I'm in a cupboard under my stairs. There you go. Wow. Okay, you're in your house. (laughs) I I, I know you have discussed this, but I can't believe you're cycling in from your home many miles away to the Olympic Park every morning. But you know, it's the quickest way. It really is the quickest way. I live, I think it's been geographically proven to be the furthest point away from the Olympic Park in London. Um, and I've tried it on public transport <laughs> and, uh, and it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. It takes me more than two hours. So a bike is the only way in. And I was going to cycle back and see you all, but a three-hour round trip on the bike, I, I thank you for letting me do it from home. That's, that's, that's it's absolutely fine. And e- even Mother Superior is feeling warm towards you. Yeah, um, well, I'm just around. thinking, though, Vassus, what are you, a man or a mouse? You know, a three-hour journey at the end of a, a day where you got up at four o'clock, why can't you do it? Yeah, come on, what's wrong with me? Yeah, what is wrong with you? <laughs> this is the Olympics, for goodness sake. <laughs> now, I heard Chris trying to wheedle a little hint of, uh, about your confession out of you earlier. Thank you very much, indeed, for re- remaining steadfast, but, uh, but you're our last, you're our last top sporting personality to confess. So, Vassos, over to you. What do you want to tell us? Father Simon and your esteemed collective, yeah. my confession comes from the last Olympics in Vancouver, the 2010 Winter Games. It's the night of the opening ceremony. And unlike at a Summer Olympics, the BBC Radio team for a winters is quite small. In fact, in Vancouver, there were just three of us. Eleanor Oldroyd, who was swanning around in Whistler, halfway up a mountain for the Alpine events, and one producer and myself. In the days leading up to the ceremony, we'd been extremely busy with a major news story from the luge track. So in amongst the mayhem of trying to stay across this story and make sure all domestic and world service outlets had everything they wanted, Radio 5 Live's plans for the ceremony itself seemed to get lost in the post somewhere between West London and Vancouver Harbour. What we thought they wanted was a few minutes of colour from me watching proceedings in the International Broadcast Centre 15 minutes or so after the extravaganza began. We also believed they'd booked Eddie the Eagle Edwards to speak to us all on the phone. However, it transpired their plans were a little different. Exactly 60 seconds before the ceremony was due to begin, i just wandered back from the Broadcast Centre's cafe with a much-needed cup of tea and was preparing to settle into my chair for a few hours' pomp and circumstance. My phone rang. The editor of the on-air programme up all night was wondering why he hadn't heard from me down the broadcast line. Turns out he'd cleared the schedule for the first hour of his programme and he was expecting live commentary from inside the stadium without even Eddie the Eagle to help me. 
a quick word about commentating on opening ceremony. It's, it's a little on the complicated side. I'm, I'm sure you heard John Murray do a fine job before the current Olympics started. Yes, he was extraordinary. He really was. Um, what you would normally get is a big book, strictly confidential, with a minute-by-minute -minute explanation of all the imagery and all the pageantry, what everything you're watching is meant to signify, basically, and you'd get to see at least one of the two rehearsals. Well, I'd seen neither, I had no book, and frankly, I wish someone had timed my subsequent sprint to the far side of the IBC, to the broadcast office, to plead for one of those books. They don't normally give out more than one per broadcast organisation, but the woman on the desk must have read the panic in my eyes and handed one over without demur. Back to the broadcast point, then seconds to spare before I was due on national radio. Just time for the equally shocked Winter Olympics producer to tell me that he was on the case, help he promised, was on the way as he disappeared from the room. So I pick up the microphone and don the headphones just as the presenter in London hands across to me. I quickly manage to press the button for stadium sound effects as the ceremony begins. I then spend much of the next hour desperately trying and most frequently failing to find the right place in the big book to describe the somewhat bizarre and surreal scenes playing out on a small monitor in front of me. Goodness knows what I was saying on national radio. All the while, though, I'm thinking, just be a little bit boring. Don't let the next hour be the stuff of blooper tapes for the rest of time. Suddenly... A British former Winter Olympian was brought into the room with much haste and left sitting next to me. Here was the promised help, but while the producer departed to find more guests, what he omitted to do was to let me know who on earth the British uh. former Winter Olympian sitting next to me actually was. Yes. So for a full 15 minutes, this kindly man sat beside me, headphones on his head, microphone in his hand, keen to offer his opinions on a wonderful opening ceremony to a national radio audience, but doubtless wondering why I steadfastly refused to bring him into the broadcast. I had no idea who he was. In my defence, I could hardly say, hello, who are you and what have you got to do with the Winter Olympics live on air? And remember, I was trying to be boring. And then just as we were about to break for a national anthem, which would have given me the chance to pause and meet with him with the mic switched off, he lost patience, got up and left. <laughs> So my first apology has to be to the listeners of Radio 5 Live that night. What they had every right to expect, what they deserved, was professional, knowledgeable, yet light-hearted commentary on a major world event. What they got was a bloke being borderline boring, saying the word Inuit a lot. <laughs> when the athletes finally started their parade, all the information I had to hand was a bit of A4 paper listing the name of the flag bearer and his or her sport and try making that sing on air. Her Belarus... Oleg Antonienko, ice hockey, and here he comes in his furry hat with his teammates <laughs> behind him. Belgium, Kevin van der Peren, figure skating, and here he comes in his furry, furry hat, hat. <laughs> with his teammates behind him. Back home, people actually had to listen to that, and all I can say is I'm sorry. I also, of course, have to apologise to the uh, former... British Winter Olympian for my perceived rudeness. The following day the games began in earnest and our paths never crossed again so to this day he must be wondering why on earth he was begged by a panic-stricken producer to come on the radio only to be roundly ignored when he agreed. All I can say is sorry I was trying to be boring and sorry to everyone else for that. Who was he? I honestly don't know. I oh, still don't know. I still don't know. Well, I think what you should have done is uh, say, I'm now joined by a, uh, a very famous uh, Olympian who will introduce himself. Tell us what you think. Yet, you know, I was slightly panicking. I I've thought since about a hundred ways I could have brought him in <laughs> cleverly with sleight of hand or sleight of mouth. Uh, but I didn't. And this poor man, honestly, he, he was staring at me wide eyed with a microphone, sort of waving it a little bit, saying, I, 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 I can talk. I've done an athlete's parade. I can help you here. And, uh, yes, I didn't okay. bring him in. Uh, all right, so, uh, basically, Matt, th this sounds like the stuff of, uh, of nightmares. It's the kind of thing that you dream about. You know, yes. you're, Suddenly, the thing that you have to do is describe an opening ceremony with no rehearsal. No notes at all. I, do you Actually, I don't know why I've gone to you first. No. It's, it's, it's the wrong order. Rebecca, yes. you go first. What do you make well, of Well, I think this is all obviously down to a lack of communication and a misunderstanding. I, I just find it extraordinary, actually, that nobody told you you were expected to commentate on the entire ceremony. Um, you, you know, you're, you're apologising to the viewers, but to be honest, they
They could have just listeners. switched off. Sorry, the listeners. Thank you, Simon. They could have just switched off. It's not like you were well, forcing did, them to They listen. would have done in their thousands. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm sure they did. I mean, you weren't sort of, you know, punishing them or anything. I think, Vassal, this has nothing to do with you. Um, so you're completely forgiven. Uh, Mother Superior. Yeah, well, I've never met Vassal. Hello, Vassal. I'm, Hi, I'm Sally. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure... I'm, are you very good looking, by the way? I, I think you are. Anyway, don't do yourself down, because I think you've got a great voice, and I think you'd make anything actually sound interesting when I was listening to your description of describing the flags and the person who was I was actually quite enthralled so I really think that you know you've got the talent to do that but anyone who gets into possible trouble because of BBC incompetence frankly has my (laughs) has my sympathy so for all those reasons uh, I will utterly and completely forgive you. And now, brother. What I remember from this particular opening ceremony, and Vassos, you might, you might remember this as well, is that there was a massive mistake in the middle of it, where one of the... They were supposed to have four pillars go up in the middle of the opening ceremony, and one of them didn't go up, and it was a massive mistake, and I believe The Guardian called it the worst Olympics ever, with the worst opening ceremony ever. So, actually, what you did is very good, because you managed to be commentating on the worst thing ever, and it didn't... So, actually, Actually, Vancouver should be thanking you because if you had had all the notes, you'd have known that they were making a complete foul up of everything. So, uh, well done. Well, thank I'm you very forgive. much. Uh, Vassos, consider yourself forgiven, and thank you very much indeed. When you should be in bed or having a bath or something like that, or in fact, maybe setting off for tomorrow's program, uh, thank you for sitting in your cupboard under the stairs and not watching BMX biking. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to this BBC Radio 2 free download. Now, why not try more? Jazz for me, I guess, is improvisation. My pick of the best in rhythm and blues. Music from Richard Thompson, Chris Wood and Pentangle, amongst many, many others. All at the BBC Radio 2 website.